Thanks, Jeff. Hi, George. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> the Deputy Chair of the uh, Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, Tumangosi, uh, and members and representatives of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, our host this evening, Ed Unjan. Bonu Ed Funde Lapamwa. Ed Unjan. You're all right. And dear members of the Tambo family, fellow South Africans, comrades, friends, ladies, and gentlemen, I, I would like to say that I was very glad indeed that uh, Duma mentioned the presence among us of members of the Lutuli Detachment. Uh, <clears throat> and these are comrades who uh, spent a lot of time together with OR, during a very difficult time uh, in the history of our movement. And indeed, uh, I say to people that if they had deserted at that time, the ANC would have died. That it didn't die is because with all of the difficulties that the ANC experienced in the 60s, they didn't desert the movement and they didn't desert the struggle. But thanks, thanks to Mom for mentioning their presence among us today. Had uh, Owar been alive today, we would have gathered in happy gatherings throughout our country to wish him a very happy centenary birthday. <clears throat> However, as we meet today to mark the centenary, we still wish to convey a heartfelt happy birthday message to him our beloved Ora and esteemed leader, certain that he will hear our message wherever he is. Accordingly, today, uh, October 27, 2017, our people, joined by the peoples of the rest of Africa and the world, stand up and say in unison, Happy birthday, our dear and respected Oliver Tambo, our beloved Or. However, at the same time as we celebrate a 100th birthday, we have gathered here today at a time of great stress for over this movement, the ANC, and this country, South Africa. And the comments we will make about Oliver Tambo as we celebrate the centenary of his birth will emphasize two matters. One of these is that periodically the ANC has had to confront and respond to threats which challenged its very existence. Another is that these threats and the ANC responses have also been related to the development of our country. And this describes what has been somewhat of an umbilical cord between the development of the ANC and the evolution of South Africa. And in this regard, I'd like to argue that for half a century, Oliver Tambo stood out as a defining player in terms of the construction of the relationship described as the, revolution, as the respective evolutions of the ANC and South Africa. I've just referred to what I described as threats which challenged the very existence of the ANC. And I'm certain that this phenomenon has not been sufficiently canvassed in the public discourse correctly to explain and implant in the public consciousness our historical evolution as a country and people. I will now mention three of these threads and elaborate on them later in my comments. By 1940, the ANC was faced with the threat of withering, withering away out of existence, that is, of ceasing to exist because of neglect by a leadership which was too preoccupied with the pursuit of its individual professional interests. The new president of the ANC, Dr. A.B. Toma, together with the Secretary General, Reverend James Kalata, 
worked successfully during the 40s to resurrect the ANC. And Oliver Tambo played a central role in this process, including as the first Secretary General of the African National Congress Youth League, and later the Secretary General and Deputy President of the ANC. The ANC resurrected in the 1940s became such a threat to our country's white minority regime that it was banned in 1960. And as all of us know, there followed a period of extreme repression imposed on our country by the apartheid regime starting in the 1960s, such that towards the end of that decade, the ANC was virtually wiped out as an organized revolutionary formation inside South Africa. And again, as we all know, exactly at the time of the banning of the ANC, its leadership sent its then Deputy President Oliver Tambo out of the country to establish and lead what was described as the external mission of the ANC. And in the end, as had happened during the 1940s, Oliver Tambo had to play a central role, this time as the leader, to help resurrect an ANC which had, which again, had almost died, had be, as had been the case in 1940. As I've said, Oliver Tambo led the successful process to defeat uh, the new and extremely serious threat to the very existence of the ANC, which arose after 1960, and helped to rebuild the ANC, which then proceeded to lead the campaign which led to the democratic victory of 1994. I'm arguing that we must pay heartfelt tribute to Oliver Tambo for the central contribution he made during the 1940s to help to resurrect the ANC from its deathbed and position it such that by 1960 it had mobilized the masses of our people to stand out as a strategic and practical opponent which threatened to overthrow the apartheid regime. And further, I'm arguing that we must pay heartfelt tribute to Oliver Tambo for his leadership of the ANC and the rest of the broad democratic movement such that this movement as a whole recovered from the near destruction brought about by the extreme repression which followed the banning of the ANC in 1960. The ANC is now, during the year of the centenary of the birth of Oliver Tambo, confronted by yet another threat of destruction. And as all of us know, the ANC is now 105 years old. And during the years of its existence, it, had faced, it has faced many challenges to its place as a preeminent and historic representative of the oppressed. These include the challenges posed by the All-African Convention in the 1930s, the formation of the PAC in 1959, the birth of such formations within the ANC as the Gang of Eight during the 1970s, and the formation of the Black Consciousness Movement again during the 1970s. The historical reality is that none of these developments succeeded to displace the ANC as what I've described as a preeminent and historic representative of the oppressed. That is why accordingly this evening I'm not discussing any of these developments, not because I'm trying to downplay their significance, Rather, I'm trying to focus on the strategic and historic challenges which have threatened the very existence of the ANC during the 105 years of its existence. And in the context of everything I've said, I would now like to make the firm and unequivocal observation that the ANC is now facing the third most serious threat to its existence of 105 years. When the ANC faced the threat of existence in 1940, its members successfully intervened to address that threat. 
And again, when it faced a threat from 1960 onwards, its members successfully intervened to address that threat. And today, the ANC faces the ANC members. <laughs> the ANC members faced yet another challenge successfully to intervene to defeat that threat. And the immense and historic challenge we face is to answer the question, does the ANC have the required members who will successfully intervene to address this new threat to the very survival of the ANC? And the ANC faces this third strategic threat during a period when, unfortunately, we no longer have Oliver Tambo among us. And therefore, the eminent leader who played a decisive role in helping our movement successfully to defeat the earlier threats. In this regard, I'd like to argue that the effect of this third challenge, this third threat, and the absolute imperative to defeat it, imposes an obligation on all those who claim to be admirers and supporters of Oliver Tambo, practically to act in a manner which lives up to the example which OR set. Thus, would we give practical expression to what is said as a matter of routine at funerals, that the nation must honor the example set by the departed, consistent with the call, long live the spirit of the heroes and heroines who have left us. In his oration, as the nation laid the mortal remains of Oliver Reginald Tambo to rest, just over 24 years ago, on the May the 2nd, 1993, Nelson Mandela made a commitment which I believe is binding on all of us. And he said, let all of us who live say that while we live, Oliver Tambo will not die. May he, for his part, rest in peace. Go well, my brother, and farewell, dear friend. As you instructed, we will bring peace to our tormented land. As you directed, we will bring freedom to the oppressed and liberation to the oppressor. As you strived, we will restore the dignity of the dehumanized. As you commanded, we will defend the option of a peaceful resolution of our problems. And as you prayed, we will respond to the cries of the wretched of the earth. And as you love them, we will always stretch out a hand of endearment to those who are your flesh and blood. In all of this, we will not fail you." Unquote. I've made the assertion that this commitment by Nelson Mandela is binding on all of us, that in all this, we will not fail you. Madiba could make this genuine commitment not as a rhetorical flourish, but as an affirmation of the very close bond of comradeship and friendship that existed between him and Oliver Tambo. And accordingly, Nelson Mandela made the commitments he announced during the oration at funerals at Oliver Tambo's funeral seriously to convey a solemn message to the nation. He could have ended his message to the nation merely by making the statement, let all of us who live say that while we live, Oliver Tambo will not die. I say this because Nelson Mandela spoke these words because what Oliver Tambo had done during half a century of struggle had helped to define the destiny of a better life for all, gener all the generations which lived on after he had passed on without exception. And all of this is because Oliver Tambo's life constitutes both a journey through the many phases of the development of South Africa and the attendant liberation struggle from the 1940s to the 1990s and the promise of liberation 
and the positive benefits this would bring. Thus, Oliver Tambo was among those in the 1940s who, as leaders and members of the ANC Youth League, stood up to say that the then central task of the ANC as the leader of our national liberation movement was to activate the masses of our people to engage in mass action to secure their own liberation. He served among the leaders and activists who helped to ensure that this vision of mass struggle was actually implemented. He served among the leaders and activists who helped our broad movement for national liberation to elaborate and adopt that seminal document, the Freedom Charter, which defined the strategic tasks of the National Democratic Revolution. Oliver Tambo served among the leaders and activists who had to ensure the continuation and intensification of the struggle, despite the banning of the ANC and the implementation by the apartheid regime of its campaign of extreme repression. And this included the successful inclusion of armed struggle into the strategy of the ANC, which meant ending a period of half a century of commitment to nonviolent struggle. He served among the leaders and activists who foresaw that the all-round liberation struggle for national liberation would oblige the apartheid regime finally to concede to the long-standing demand of the ANC and the rest of the liberation movement for a negotiated end to apartheid and white minority rule, and therefore ensured that the movement prepared for this eventuality. What all this means <coughs> is that Oliver Tambo was present as one of our leaders at all seminal moments in the evolution of the ANC and our struggle during the 50 years from the 1940s to the 1990s. Accordingly, as we mark the centenary of his birth, we must celebrate the enormous contribution which he made to the victory of the Democratic Revolution in 1994. When Dr. A.B. Thomas delivered his presidential address at the ANC National Conference in 1941, he said, quote, since Congress was founded and made its initial spectacular success, it has experienced periods of inactivity because you and I believe that organizations led by non-Africans were more dignified than African organizations. And thus we abandoned our organizations and surrendered our leadership to others. And he said, fellow countrymen, this is a challenge. Shall we not pick up the gauntlet? South Africa, white and black needs us. We must pull our full weight. We must make our real contribution to the building and the progress of South Africa to the full benefit, mutual helpfulness, and happiness of all sections, black and white, unquote. And the truth is that when Dr. Kuma acceded to the position of the ANC, of president of the ANC in 1940, the ANC was to all intents and purposes dormant and moribund. And as I've said, he, together with the Reverend James Kalata, worked to resurrect the ANC, and it is in that context that they made the call to pick up the gauntlet. And in that same 1941 presidential address, Dr. Krumer detailed some of the burning issues which faced the African people at the time. And then he went on to say that Congress must take steps for representations to be made to the Right Honorable the Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, the Field Marshal J.C. Smarts, and Deputy uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Native Affairs, Colonel Dennis Ritz, on the various pending issues he had identified. And this short history of the ANC I've mentioned is directly re related to the vitally important contribution Oliver Tambo made, which I've said led to the victory of the Democratic Revolution in 1994. In a letter written to the ANC and published in January 1956, uh, Dr. Kroma wrote that the foundation representatives of the what he called the foundation representatives 
of the ANC Youth League. Quote, met with me in my library at home and were baptized and established by me and the late Mr. Arvis Lopetema at the Bantuman Social Center in Johannesburg as the African National Congress Youth League. And addressing the delegates in 1944, a diploma said you have been summoned to assemble in this hall to discuss an important question. The question of the formation of an organization to solve the problem of African people, a problem of a future South Africa. You've been called upon to discuss the formation of a youth league under the African National Congress. And he said the proposal of the formation of this organization was passed in Bloemfontein in 1942 and also confirmed in 1943 by the Conference of the African National Congress, unquote. I believe that it is in the context, in this context, that the involvement of these then young people in the establishment of the ANC Youth League, among whom its first secretary, where its first secretary, General Oliver Tambo, assumes its importance. That importance derives from the fact that it seems obvious that the historic process to resurrect and reactivate the ANC would have been seriously compromised if it had not included the initiative to establish the Youth League as an organ of the ANC charged with the task to mobilize the youth into the struggle. In this regard, I must also mention the important fact that it was also under the Kuma Kalata leadership in 1948 that the ANC Women's League was established to take the place of the Bantu Women's League, which had been established in 1918, led by Charlotte McClack. It is also worth noting, and I think all of us should hide our heads in shame, it's also worth noting that it was only through a decision taken at the 1943 conference that the ANC allowed women to join it as members. And the importance of the posture adopted by the Youth League concerning the conduct of the struggle was underlined by the conflict which arose later between Dr. Kuma and the leadership of the Youth League which was ultimately resolved through the adoption of the 1949 Program of Action. And all of us know that the conflict centered on the matter of what the resurrected and reactivated ANC should do to achieve the liberation of the oppressed. And so that's why it opposed the suggestion by Dr. Kuma that uh, the ANC should, pet should petition Jan Smarts and Dennis Reeds, and took the position that there should be no petition submitted to the oppressor. And a vitally important part of the position taken by the Youth League was that the posture of struggle on which it insisted would mean and did mean that the resurrected and reactivated ANC would be transformed into a mass organization capable of mobilizing the millions of our people into the struggle. The changes brought about by that resurrected and reactivated uh, the ANC laid the firm basis in terms of which the end, in the end, it was possible to mount a multi-pronged and sustained strategic op op offensive to defeat the apartheid regime, with the ANC serving as a universally accepted leader of that offensive. I would now like to mention a few bare biographical facts about Oliver Tambo to highlight his important place among the leadership of the ANC over the half century I've mentioned. And as I've said, he was elected as the first Secretary General of the ANC Youth League in 1944. He was then 27 years old. Three years later, in 1947, aged 30, he became a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC. And six years later, at age of 36 in 1953, he was elected Secretary General of the ANC to replace Walter Sisulu, who had been banned. And five years later, in 1958, when he was only 41 years old, 
Owar was elected deputy president to our outstanding leader, Ngosi Albert Lutuli. And the ANC sent him its deputy president out of the country in 1960. Again, as I've said, to head was the, what was then called the external mission of the movement. And that position was confirmed in an ANC conference held in Lobatsen in, in Petronaland then in 1962, confirming a decision which had only been taken by the National Executive Committee. And unfortunately, we lost the ANC president, Gosi A.J. Lutuli, in 1967, who died in suspect circumstances. Owar, then 50 years old, became the acting president of the ANC while acting, continuing to as the head of the external mission. And he was elected president of the ANC at the 1985 ANC consultative conference held in Cabo, Zambia. And regrettably, regrettably, he suffered from a stroke in 1989, which severely, severely limited his capacity to continue fully to play his leadership role. And he handed over the presidency of the ANC to Nelson Mandela, when the latter was elected to this position at the 1991 National Conference of the ANC. And that same conference elected Owar to the position of national chairperson of the ANC, a position he held until he unfortunately passed away in 1993. And before I started mentioning this short political biography of Oliver Tambo, I had said that the changes effected during the 1940s by the ANC leadership, which leadership included OR, ultimately created the possibility for the liberation movement to mount a multi-pronged and sustained strategic offensive to defeat the apartheid regime, with the ANC serving as a universally accepted leader of that offensive. And as all of us know, the ANC identified the prongs, what it described as the four pillars of that strategy, as mass struggle, the international isolation of the apartheid system, ANC underground work, and the armed struggle. And all of these were important parts of the sustained general offensive which resulted in the ultimate defeat of the apartheid regime. And each of the pillars I've mentioned constituted a complex process with regard both to identifying the specific tasks that had to be implemented, which had to change as circumstances changed, and ensuring the actual implementation of these evolving tasks. Oliver Tambo played a central role with regard to the development of each and all of these pillars, all of which rested on the strategic base established by the changes to the ANC effected in the 1940s, <clears throat> in whose elaboration and implementation, as I've said, Howard was a central actor. And as we all know, the ANC leadership took what proved to be a critically important decision when, as we've said earlier, it sent its then Deputy President Oliver Tambo out of the country to head the external mission. <clears throat> this was at the beginning of a period of extreme repression, which after some time, and for some time, virtually decimated the structures of the ANC within the country and made it impossible for it fully to discharge its responsibilities within the country as a direct leader of the liberation movement. And as all of us will recall, that included the arrest, assassination, imprisonment of virtually the entirety of the most significant echelons of the leadership of the ANC and related formations. And this elevated the importance of what had been intended to serve only as the external mission of the ANC, placing an obligation on the external mission, in fact, to serve as the headquarters and guiding body of the ANC as a whole. And effectively, this positioned OR as the leader of the ANC, the first among equals for more than a quarter of a century, which proved to be the then most difficult period in the history of the ANC. And he ultimately came to enjoy the unqualified respect of all sections of the ANC at home and abroad, 
and the related mass democratic movement. <clears throat> and at the same time, the overwhelming majority of people in the rest of the world, starting from the rest of Africa, recognized him as a legitimate representative and spokesperson of the oppressed majority in our country. I'm saying, therefore, that as we mark the centenary of his birth, <clears throat> excuse me, we must pay unreserved tribute to him, to OR for his vital contribution to the benchmark achievements of the ANC and the broad liberation movement over many decades. And to summarize, I refer you to the, here to the vital changes the ANC decided upon and implemented during the 1940s. The development and implementation of the strategy of mass struggle and the greatest unity of the democratic forces, which played a vital role in the defeat of the apartheid regime. I'm referring to the development of a united international movement for the isolation of apartheid South Africa, which was central to the victory over the, that, that regime. And the reconstruction of the ANC in the underground machinery in our country, which the, en enabled the ANC more directly to live up to its responsibility, practically to act as a leader and representative of the oppressed. <clears throat> and I'm referring to the pursuit of the armed struggle, such that <clears throat> despite all challenges, the struggle played a critical role in asserting the resolve of the oppressed to overcome all obstacles to achieve their liberation. And I'm referring to the, prepara the preparations the ANC undertook to ensure that it was properly equipped to engage in a new field of struggle, that is negotiations with the apartheid regime. I'm insisting that with regard to all of these strategic interventions which made the 1994 democratic victory possible, we had Oliver Tambo as a decisive leading and defining player. And for this reason, today as we mark the centenary of his birth, <clears throat> I have no hesitation to convey my heartfelt view that it is to Oliver Tambo to award that we should both bestow the title the father of South Africa's democracy. <clears throat> it was not possible that Oliver Tambo could achieve what he did as a leader of, a, of the ANC, and as I've tried to indicate, <clears throat> unless he had the personal capacity and attributes in this regard. I was very fortunate that for almost two decades, decades, I was privileged to work quite closely with, with Oliver Tambo within the structures of the ANC. And this gave me some understanding of the character of this eminent patriot and leader of our people. And I'm honored to use this understanding to help us properly to celebrate the centenary of his birth and therefore to pay tribute to him as one of our most eminent heroes and people's representatives. To come back to the 1941 presidential address by Dr. Kuma, he said, uh, <clears throat> to Congress, we must be loyal and true. And then not that water, this what? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he said, to Congress, we must be loyal and true. This was Dr. Kuma. To Congress, we must be loyal and true. For Congress, we must forget any personal or sectional interests or gain. We must put the cause and the interests of the people before any expediency. To be true leaders, we must put the interests and welfare of our people above our own." Unquote. <clears throat> and much later in, December 19, in a December 19, 1955 letter to the ANC, which was published in January 1956, Dr. Kluma said, and I quote, leadership means service for 
and not domination over others. True, he said true and genuine leaders serve the cause of the people and do not expect the cause to serve them or become a source of profit and honor for them. <laughs> and he said, Africa expects all, her, expects all her sons and daughters to serve the cause of the people loyally, sincerely, and honestly. Unquote. I cite these remarks by A.B. Toma because as we mark the centenary of Oar's birthday, I believe that all our people should understand that Oar became a leader of the South African oppressed and more accepted by all at home and abroad because of particular attributes. And at the heart of all Oliver Tambo's belief system was exactly what uh, Dr. Toma had communicated to him and his other youthful comrades that the Congress, to Congress we must be loyal and true. For Congress we must forget any personal or sectional interests or gain. We must put the cause and the interest of the people before any expediency. <clears throat> I can confirm that whatever else OR did during all the years I, I worked with him, this prescript remained his constant guide. To Congress, we must be loyal and true, and we must put the cause and interest of the people before any expediency. <clears throat> and never would he depart from any action which would violate these two principles, that is loyalty to the ANC and its values and commitment to pursue the interests, genuine interests of the people. And this makes the correct point that Oliver Tambo was a principled person. Accordingly, all of us knew that in all our interactions with OR, we had to honor the principles and practices always to tell the truth, to respect the principle of honesty, to exercise our right to state our views, to behave according to agreed rules in terms of our membership of the ANC, and never to promote whatever might be our personal interests by telling lies or engaging in subterfuge. <laughs> in all of this, we also knew that OR had other personal attributes which made all of us very happy that he had surrendered himself to serve our movement, the ANC, the struggle, and the people as a whole. And this related to the fact that he had a very sharp intellect. As he grew up, he had demonstrated outstanding competence in the natural sciences, including mathematics, physics, and chemistry, and taught these subjects at high school. Nevertheless, he also had the knowledge to engage in debates which discuss issues relevant to the social sciences. He also acquired the necessary qualifications to practice as a lawyer who could and would disappear in, would appear in our courts, especially to de defend our people against the ravages of the apartheid system. And as a leader of the external mission of the ANC, among others, he demonstrated his leadership as an activist for the development of the arts in all their forms, including as expressed in the music in which he was especially interested. <clears throat> and the sharp intellect he showed made him a great strategist and master tactician in terms of the conduct of the liberation struggle over the many decades I've mentioned. And he demonstrated that immense capacity in matters of strategy. For instance, when he persuaded our movement to prepare for negotiations and defining the democratic South Africa through those nego negotiations, even as he led the same movement in its efforts to intensify its offensive to overthrow the, the oppressor regime. To put this matter more generally, Omar understood that the very advances we achieved through struggle would result in producing a qualitatively new situation presenting us with the task to have to respond 
to the challenges posed by our own victories. And all of this means that at all times, OWAR did everything to ensure that our movement not, never lost sight of the strategic goals it had to achieve at all stages of our struggle. I would also like to suggest that for us to gain an excellent grasp of OWAR's capacity as a master tactician of our struggle, everybody should study the January 8th ANC anniversary statements he presented during the years 1979 to 1989. I think in those statements we would see the, that the comments and proposals in those statements constitute a virtual catalog of the evolution of our struggle in all its four pillars, demonstrating the capacity properly to understand the objective situation and to respond to that situation correctly and on time. It is a matter of common cause that OWAR succeeded to lead the ANC both to recover from the heavy blows it suffered during the post-1960 period of extreme repression and to resume its legal existence from 1990 as a united organization. And fundamental to that unity were what OWAR did working with other leaders of our movement to ensure that our movement as a whole understood and rallied around one, a shared value system, loyally to serve the movement and the people, opposed to unethical practice aiming at self-aggrandizement. And this included aversion to all initiatives by anybody to seek to position themselves as leaders merely to promote selfish interests. This also meant a shared understanding of the movement's strategic and tactical goals and a common commitment to achieve those goals, ready to make the necessary sacrifices in that regard. And it meant a shared commitment among all members of the movement to work with one another as comrades, fully understanding that the realization of the common goal of achieving national liberation and building a democratic, non-racial, and non-sexist South Africa require that these comrades must act together as one united movement. I draw attention to these three points concerning the issue of the unity of the movement because I hear these days calls being made that people must unite. <laughs> and I'm saying Oliver Tambo was saying you must unite around a certain value system. You must unite. <laughs> He must unite around certain goals aimed at serving the interests of the people, and we must unite around the issue of behaving truly as comrades and not ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and what also contributed greatly to that unity was the manner in which OR conducted the internal discussions within the ANC. He would always listen to and respect all opinions expressed, and then state his own view in a manner which would assure all participants that their views had been taken into account. And this helped enormously to inspire a spirit of inclusivity among the members, and a sense of common ownership of everything to do with the movement and the struggle. I must also mention that Owar was a convinced Pan-Africanist. This helped further to entrench this outlook throughout the ranks of the ANC and contributed in no small measure to the development of the attitude among millions throughout our continent that the struggle to defeat the apartheid system was as much ours as it was theirs. It is in this context that I'm certain that the important matter of the renaissance of our continent must occupy significant space on our agenda. <laughs> Earlier I said that the ANC now faces a third threat of, third threat of destruction since its foundation almost 106 years ago. And this time that threat emanates from acts of commission 
originating from within the ANC itself. As we all know, the ANC gained access to state power from 1994 onwards. It was inevitable that this would happen because of the place which the ANC occupied in the hearts and minds of the majority of our people as their true representative. However, the challenge which arose with this access to state power was and is that it could be abused, was and is being abused for purposes of self-enrichment. This means that the ANC contains within its ranks people who are absolutely contemptuous of the most fundamental values of the ANC at whose center is a commitment selflessly to serve the people. <clears throat> These are people who only see the ANC as a step ladder to enable them to access state power for the ex express purpose of using that access for self-enrichment. By definition, and these are people who are card-carrying members of the ANC, uh, our national governing party since 1994, but who have completely repudiated the value system which inspired Oliver Tambo throughout his life. And part of the national tragedy in this regard is that the ANC recognized the emergence of this immensely negative phenomenon quite early after 1994. For instance, in his political report at the 1997 National Conference of the ANC, Nelson Mandela said, among other things, a number of, and I quote, a number of negative features within the ANC and the broad democratic movement have emerged during the last three years. One of these negative features is the emergence of careerism within our ranks. Many among our members see their membership of the ANC as a means to advance their personal ambitions, to attain positions of power, and access to resources for their own individual gratification. And he continued accordingly, they work to manipulate the movement to create the conditions for their success. And he said during this period, We've also been faced with various instances of corruption involving our own members, including those who occupy positions of authority by virtue of the victory of the democratic revolution. These have sought either to steal public resources or to extort financial tributes from the people. And he said, this is not surprising in the light of what we've already said in this report about the entrenchment of corruption in our society in general and the consequent desperate desire to accumulate wealth in the shortest possible period of time, unquote. And almost 20 years later, and only three months ago, I'm quite sure that all of you will remember the ANC Secretary General Gwede Mantashe delivered what was called a diagnostic organizational report. <laughs> In which he said, among other things, quote, <clears throat> we owe it <clears throat> to ourselves first, the movement and society, to analyze in detail the implications of a liberation movement that has ascended to power and therefore controls huge resources. Being in power is rapidly becoming a source of political bankruptcy, in that members of the ANC fight for deployment either as councillors, MPLs, and MPs, respectively, as if there is no tomorrow. And he said the use of money to buy votes or elections in the party is at the heart of the decline of the quality of the structures across the board. Money has replaced consciousness as a basis for being elected into leadership positions at all levels of the organization. And he, said, and he said, the ethical behavior of leaders is no longer an issue, as it has been replaced by status. And he said, cadres of our movement should be guided by values of honesty, 
of humility, of hard work, of commitment, of sacrifice and selflessness. And he said, we hardly talk about these values which in sections of our movement are seen as backward and a hindrance to people accessing quick material benefit. That was quite a mantache only three months ago. And in the 1997-1997 political report, as I've cited, Nelson Mandela also said that, quote, in reality, during the last three years, we have found it difficult to deal with such careerists in a decisive manner. We ourselves have therefore allowed the space to emerge for these opportunists to pursue their counter-revolutionary goals to the detriment of our movement and struggle. And he said, clearly, we have to take all necessary measures to purge ourselves of such members and organize ourselves in a way that will make it difficult for corrupt elements to gain entry into our movement, unquote. But the fact of the matter is that during the last two decades, the ANC has failed to do the two things which Nelson Mandela mentioned in 1997, to purge itself of the mercenaries who had joined its ranks, and to make it difficult for such elements to join the movement. And that failure surely means that inevitably, the negative, negative situation which Nelson Mandela decried would get worse, as was attested to by ANC Secretary General Mantashe in July. The numbers of those who see the ANC as but a mere tool to access political power and corruptly acquired wealth would increase. In the end, it was inevitable that this would result in the transformation of quantity into a new, a new element, a transformation from quantity into quality in this way. What was and was seen to be abnormal 20 years ago in 1997 would become the norm by 2017. Hence the observation made by Secretary General Mandashe, Mandashe concerning fights for deployment among ANC members as if there is no tomorrow. This means that the historic value system of the ANC has become so corrupted that its replacement, that is unprincipled access to political power and the related corrupt self-enrichment have in fact become the norm within the organization. It is this reality which has led to the universal scramble for deployment and indeed the repugnant phenomenon of the murders of and among municipal councillors so prevalent but not only in KwaZulu-Natal, a matter which is currently being investigated in that province by the Mwerane Commission. Necessarily and logically, the qualitative change I've mentioned, arising from the failure to defeat the process of the increase in the numbers of those who remained in the ranks of the ANC for selfish and corrupt reasons, as described by Nelson Mandela, would in the end also affect the composition and quality of the very leadership of the movement. It is therefore perfectly obvious that what has happened is that there has been an institutional ascendance to a position of dominance or major influence at all levels of leadership in the ANC of exactly the negative elements whom Nelson Mandela urged the ANC to defeat. I'm therefore arguing that the transformation of quantity into quality has resulted in the entrenchment within the ANC of a rapacious and predatory value system. And the ascendance to positions of authority or major influence in the leadership structures of the ANC of people who are both the product and expression of that rapacious and predatory value system. 
<clears throat> I will now cite just one example to illustrate the qualitative, qualitative change I've been talking about. The 1997 Maikeng ANC National Conference took an important decision that those who are elected to leadership positions in the ANC should be ready to discharge their responsibilities in that regard, with no expectation that their positions in the ANC entitle them to positions in government. It was therefore decided that ANC candidates for the pos position of provincial premier should be selected in the same manner as the national ministers with no requirement that the provincial chair of the ANC would necessarily become the premier. But in the run-up to the 2007 Pulukwane ANC National Conference, a spurious, a spurious argument emerged within the ANC about a non-existent problem of two centers of power, so-called. <laughs> And as a result of this, the Pulugwane Conference took the diametrically opposed position to the Maikeng Conference. It now said, instead, that any person elected as president of the ANC would be the ANC candidate for the position of president of the republic. This also meant that the provincial chair of the ANC would be the provincial premier. This unfortunate decision meant that formally the ANC took the decision that occupation of senior positions in the ANC was a guaranteed route of access to state power. <laughs> exactly the kind of understanding which the movement had sought to discourage among the membership as a whole. The negative situation I've sought to describe according to which, particularly as a governing party, allows itself to behave according to a rapacious value system of conscious abuse of state power for corrupt, corrupt self-enrichment and permits itself to be influenced by a leadership informed by that value system necessarily produces certain systemic consequences. And among these are the corruption and weakening of the ANC and the rest of the progressive movement. The corruption and weakening of the institutions of the democratic state, the undermining of the precepts and practices of our constitutional democracy, state capture, failure to achieve significant advances with regard to achieving the goal of a better life for all, and virtual abandonment, of the historic Pan-Africanist perspective of the ANC. To emphasize how dangerous these inevitable outcomes are, I can well imagine how much those are now rejoicing who were the diehards who belong to the apartheid system and who never fully accepted that ours should become a non-racial democracy. <laughs> Perhaps the most famous of Karl Marx's thesis on Feuerbach is the last, which says that philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. <clears throat> now, I've sought to suggest that the negative situation currently affecting and characterizing the ANC will, unless it is addressed correctly and immediately, sooner rather than later, result in the destruction of the ANC. It would therefore seem that those who remain genuine members of the ANC, honestly committed to its historic value system, centered on selfless service to the people, should take the necessary steps to change the self-destructive course on which the movement has embarked, which among others has lost the ANC much support as demons among the people, as demonstrated in the successive national, provincial, and local government elections since 2009 to date. As a first step, these members of the ANC must genuinely accept that the movement is immersed in a deep crisis 
and then proceed to characterize the source and the nature of the problem. As Oliver Tambo did, which tries to save the ANC from distract destruction, understanding that without a correct diagnosis, there can be no effective and successful cure. And I believe that this should implement what Nelson Mandela suggested in 1997, when he said we have to take all necessary measures to purge ourselves of such members and organize ourselves in a way that will make it difficult for corrupt elements to gain entry into our movement. And in this regard, I believe that the ANC policy document through the Eye of a Needle, the ANC oath, which is in, a con in its constitution, the values stated by A.B. Kloma, and accepted and implemented by Oliver Tambo and others since the 1940s, and the conduct of lifestyle audits would help to, temp to, temp to, temp to determine exactly who is a genuine member of the ANC. <laughs> I would also suggest that these members should conduct an open and honest assessment of the damage that has been done as the ANC allowed itself to fall under the influence of the rapacious value system and leadership I've mentioned and decide on measures that must be taken to address that damage. In this context, the ANC members whom I've referred must come back to the matter of redefining or restating the current strategic goals it faces, which I'm certain would include the eradication of poverty, the eradication of inequality, the strengthening of the democratic state, and African renewal. And here I'm not talking about drawing up some wish list and pretend, and pretend that this is the kind of program that is required. I'm talking about the setting of strategic goals and indicating the realistic measures which should be adopted to achieve the set objectives, following on the footsteps of what I said about O.R. Tambo, uniting the movement around agreed and clear goals. And I'm making all these suggestions about what genuine members of the ANC should do out of respect for the fact that O.R. never merely sought to interpret our situation but always worked to change it. And as all of us have sought to celebrate the centenary of his birth, we have shouted slogans such as, long live the spirit of Oliver Tam. <laughs> and some among us, out of respect for Owar, have even gone so far as to claim that they know how he would respond to some specific current situation <laughs> or event. <laughs> However, I believe that the best way to honor Oliver Tambo, as we mark the centenary of his birth, would be to live up to the example he has set by always being loyal to the truth, by always being loyal to principle and the historic value system of the ANC, by defeating the rapacious and predatory value system and the related leadership which are holding the ANC hostage. By helping to unite the ANC and the rest of the progressive movement and the people as a whole around a realistic program for the acceleration of the advance towards achieving the goal of a better life for all. By helping to ensure the full and unfettered functioning of our country as a constitutional democracy. And by reasserting in practical ways the principle and practice that we share a common destiny with our fellow Africans, including those in the African diaspora. I'm convinced that if especially the generations currently in the, in the ANC did all of this, walking in the footsteps of Oliver Tambo, uh, they would help to achieve the historic goal of res rescuing the ANC from destruction, as Oliver Tambo did in his day. History <clears throat> will answer the question unequivocally whether we had the courage to live up to the extraordinary legacy which Oliver Tambo left behind. 
and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> much ladies and gentlemen thank you very much president Tabombeki, my leader my intellectual crush another round of applause ladies and gentlemen please each and every single individual who has made this event, this historical occasion, what it is today. We've had such incredible contributions. Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, for their unplugged performance. They certainly deserve a round of applause. Absolutely. Can we get a round of applause for the Unity School Choir? I'll be welcoming them back on the stage before I introduce the CEO of the Oliver and Adelaide Tabo Foundation, Melinda Villagazi. I will call on the choir to come on stage. We will be hearing from this incredible group, Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, just beforehand as we get into our cake cutting. But also, um, I'd, I'd really like to thank every single one of the passionate individuals that are here tonight, your songs, your inspiration, the emotion, I mean, it is palpable. I can feel it literally in my veins. So All right, uh, former President Thabo Mbeki uh, delivering the lecture at Wits University in honor of Oa Tan uh, Tambo, the centenary. And it was known that he yeah. was critical of the current ANC leadership, uh, but he has never, as, as far as I know, spoken this strongly. And, and you